Okay, I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Jim Powell. Good evening and welcome to Evening at Egan. Hope everyone is well and safe this evening. Uh, we have a great uh, presentation in front of us this evening. My name is Jim Powell. I teach and do research at UAS. And tonight it is my honor to introduce my friend, Dr. Sonia Nagorski. Dr. Nagorski is an assistant professor of geology at UAS. She has lived in Juneau for 16 years and teaches a variety of earth science classes covering topics ranging from the ancient fossil records to modern natural disasters and the science of energy and mineral resources. She, in, she earned her bachelor degree in geology and history from Amherst College and her MS and PhD in geology from the University of Montana with a specialty in environmental geochemistry. As a kid growing up in the big cities and only later having exposure to the natural world, she is fascinated by the ways in which modern human activities affect Earth's systems. Her research projects focus on a variety of contaminants of which plastic is her new, newest subject. She is passionate about providing undergraduate st students with opportunities to experience the thrill of discovery in science and to become more knowledgeable citizens and stewards of our planet. But besides her academic achievements, which are all very impressive, on top of it all, Sonia is a mother, an activist. She contributes her time and scientific knowledge to making Juno a better place to live. And she's just a great person. Please join virtually in welcoming Dr. Sonia Nagorski. Well, thank you, Jim, for the very kind introduction. <clears throat> and first, I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional lands of the Aqua and Clinket people, Sukunishchich. Thanks to all of you for spending an hour of your Friday night tuning into yet another Zoom call, which you're probably pretty sick of after what has probably been an entire week of Zoom meetings. So thanks for your time. And so tonight, what I'd like to do is give you a general overview on the issue of global plastic pollution and to showcase some research that undergraduate students here at UAS have done with me to investigate this emerging contaminant here in Juneau. So now I'm gonna share my screen with my presentation and I'm gonna um, stop my video and keep my mute on and you can minimize all the other squares here so that you can see my presentation. And let me know, um, I can't really see the chat screen. So Jim, chime in if there's anything wrong with uh, the, the quality of what you're seeing. <clears throat> All right, so we'll take it away here. <clears throat> All right, so you've probably seen the headlines that plastic is everywhere. Even though the widespread use of plastics has uh, began little more than half a century ago, plastic pollution has already spread to the most remote parts of the world. <clears throat> and for several decades now, we've known that it's pervasive in the upper ocean especially. Plastic enters the ocean from mismanaged waste on land that then gets carried in by winds or stream water, wastewater, or even via direct dumping into the ocean. And about 80% of the marine plastic pollution comes off the land. The largest contributors are small everyday single-use products like straws and cups, plastic bags and food wrappers, plastic bo uh, and bottles. And additionally, and becoming increasingly important, are very small particles, microplastics, that pass through wastewater treatment plants and enter that way. So that's coming largely from synthetic um, clothing. Uh, studies have shown that a single washing of a fleece jacket, and fleece is, is plastic, can release a quarter of a million microfibers into wastewater. And, and a single acrylic garment releases almost a, a, a million fibers. About 16% of the world plastic production goes into clothing. So there's also many sources from ships and boats, for example, in the form of discarding fishing nets and ship wastewater as well. So large plastic debris causes 
starvation, entanglement, and drowning in numerous species of marine fish, mammals, and birds. And they also transport other chemical contaminants. 90% of seabirds in a recent study had plastics in their stomachs. A recent study in Australia showed that every sample of seafood measured had some amount of plastic in it. People eat that seafood, including the microplastics and the attached contaminants, and scientists are only beginning to look into those effects. Plastics can travel thousands of miles from where they came. They get caught up in these great oceanic garbage patches and can be washed up on distant beaches, such as Henderson and Midway Islands in the Pacific, shown here. The Pacific is particularly notorious, but all the major oceans on Earth, including the Arctic, are contaminated with it to some extent. And then what's uh, worse is that the surface floating plastic has recently been shown to account for only about 1% of the plastic in the ocean. The rest of it appears to sink into the deep sea. And uh, what happens to it there is also largely unknown. So some plastics have a um, are just denser, like PVC. They're denser than seawater and then sink, but then even the lightweight plastics can get biofouled or colonized with phytoplankton. They clump together and then they become denser and fall to the seabed. A plastic bag was even found at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. That's what this photo here shows. The most recent estimates show that we uh, that about 26 million tons of plastic are dumped into the ocean each year. And it's kind of a number that's hard to understand what that is, but picture a dump truck backing up into the ocean about every 40 seconds. So this uh, the ocean now contains, you know, these rough estimates of 50 trillion plastic particles, about 500 times more than the stars in our galaxy. And this number is projected to double in the next 30 years when if nothing changes and we, we're, we continue this increase, there will be more plastic by mass than fish in the oceans. Plastics that are of particularly small size, the microplastics, uh, they are either intentionally manufactured that small as additives to say toothpaste or cosmetics as abrasives, they started off or um, that started off as large plastic but then fractured into smaller and smaller sizes can become these microplastics. So th these are defined as less than five millimeters in size, which is about the size of a, a grain of rice. And um, they're also the category of nanoplastics, which are even smaller than that. Those are less than a micron. So one one thousandth of a millimeter is a nanoplastic. So most of the research to date has been in the oceans and only recently has attention been turned to plastic pollution on land and in freshwater. <clears throat> and new work shows that plastic pollution, sure enough, shows up on um, in the terrestrial uh, sphere as well. It is It comes down via wet or dry deposition. So with rain and snow, it's been found on glaciers, um, in rivers and lakes in soils and um, the, uh, the uh, in and all over the world in Africa and the Arctic, the US Great Lakes glaciers in the actually just one glacier in the Alps and another on the Tibetan plateau. It's even shown to uh, come off of sea spray by the coasts and it's in the rain and in the air. And these articles Various research shows that there isn't a single nook or cranny on earth that isn't impacted. And so, spoiler alert, I'm here to tell you tonight that this includes Juno, but you probably knew that already. So a few quick facts and figures about plastic and its production. Why is it everywhere? Well, it comes from, first of all, the fact that it's been, uh, this is new material that's been produced largely since about 1950. There were some forms of plastic in the late 1800s, but it really didn't take off till after World War II. 8.3 billion tons of plastics have been produced so far, and we're making about 400 million tons per year. And that's uh, with a gro growth rate of about 5% a year. So that's an exponential growth rate. Uh, about a million plastic bottles are purchased around the world every minute. In the the last 20 years, we've produced more plastic than in the 50 years prior. So it's kind of an astounding fact to think about, like since I graduated from grad school, half the world's plastic was produced. So that's a, 
kind of uh, daunting. In terms of what happens to it, this is a figure that shows the primary production, 8,300 million metric tons of plastic produced this big blue arrow here. And then here's what happens to it. About 2,500 is currently still in use in the form of you know, construction material and couches and I don't know, ski boots and uh, all sorts of products that currently have plastic in it, cars, shoes. <clears throat> and then um, about 8% of it's been recycled about another 8% has been incinerated and then 4,900 has already been discarded into landfills or uh, mismanaged and gone directly into water bodies. But when it's discarded, the problem is that it doesn't really go away. It, um, none of the commonly used plastics are biodegradable on any kind of um, you know, short-term time scale. As a result, they mostly accumulate rather than decompose in landfills. And so the same qualities that make plastics such a good material for us to use, and that is cheap, durable, persistent, inert, lightweight, low cost, they, um, this has been a savior to many medical applications. And there's a lot of good uh, uses that we have from plastic, but its stability, its lack of reac reactivity also creates this problem that it doesn't degrade it, or does so extremely slowly. Large plastics, instead of degrading, they just become smaller and smaller. Um, this is the the life cycle of plastics, like the average, the projected estimated amount of time it takes for these things to degrade. And as they break, as the large plastics just fall apart and become small, and, and they break into smaller and smaller pieces down to the size even smaller than the width of a human cell. So they're easily transported and they become quickly a contaminant all over the world. I should also note all also has a large carbon footprint. It accounts for about 8% of the demand for global oil. So with global plastic pollution expected to triple by about 2050, along with the fact that some plastics can take hundreds of years to, to biodegrade or photodegrade, microplastic pollution is a problem that is not going away anytime soon. There are also important health concerns. Uh, one study showed that we, we Americans, we eat 50,000 tiny pieces of plastic every year. We inhale another 50,000 pieces and largely these health effects are unknown. But uh, what we do know, there are concerns, there's more uh, work coming out showing that there, aren't, there can be negative impacts to reproductive health and some types can be cancer causing but again, this is a pretty new area of research and it really depends on um, a lot of different um, scenarios for the, the way the plastic can get in. The plastic can also attach and con concentrate other contaminants that they encounter and they, which can be potentially toxic. They all, in addition to these chemical or biochemical effects, there's also physical effects because, because they can fragment into pieces small enough to enter our organs and our cells we don't really know what the impact is of having these particles with uh, physically within our um, cellular structure. <clears throat> now looking at the whole world, the deposition to every corner of the earth um, is one of the main arguments for the geologists proposing that we rename our current geologic epoch as the Anthropocene. And we're currently in the Holocene, but the uh, scientists are saying that we should probably rename it uh, the Anthropocene due to nuclear fallout, our current mass extinction, the disappearance of glaciers and ice sheets, and plastic is another one of the reasons. The, the amount of plastic we've produced so far would be enough to wrap the earth in a layer of cling wrap. And this wrapping is going to continue faster and faster this century unless trends uh, don't continue the way they're going. So the science of plastic pollution is really new. And we know, though, that plastics will be around for many centuries to come. And there are uh, the scientists are just trying to figure out how to measure it. There aren't even any set agreed upon protocols for how to sample plastics, how to measure them. And it makes cr cross comparison among studies really difficult. But we do know that the scale of the problem keeps rising. And so there's an urgent need to start cataloging and understanding the problem. 
And one of the basic new questions in science are like, well, how do microplastics travel? Where do they accumulate? What impacts do they have? And so that's, so the question that I've had is what is the level of impact to Juno? As far as I know, no one's really looked at microplastics in Juno before. And so um, this is a question that my students and I set out to answer. So all in all, I had about 26 students work on this question with me over the last year, either as independent research projects and um, or via a, a class that I taught specifically on the topic of plastic pollution. And we set out to go see what we could find in terms of evidence of this pollution in Juno. And so we had about um, six students went out and did a trash pickup along the beach and along Egan Drive and cataloged the types of like a large scale litter and did a study on that. But most students worked on uh, the search for microplastics. And so this is what I'm going to show you now is the results of their work in glaciers, lakes, and uh, streams and beaches around town. So first on the ice field, one set of students inspected filters that remained from a Florida State University graduate student, Megan Benke, snow sampling project on the Juno ice field. She was actually not targeting plastics, but my students swooped in when she was done filtering her melted snow samples to see what they could find. And out of 15 samples collected on many different parts of the ice field, uh, each, each sample covering about one square foot, they found a grand total of two microplastics, which is within the air of lab contamination. So considering this, we couldn't conclude that there were any detectable microplastics on the Juno ice field. However, the total area covered by these 15 samples was only about one and a half meters squared. So I would say we need to look at that again as um, when possible. So that looked promising. That was a good sort of initial survey, like, okay, it's not everywhere on the ice field. Then I had another student, Brooke Keller, who worked for a helicopter company on the ice field. And last fall, while she was still taking my class, she was still going up to the ice field. And so she grabbed a sample from a supraglacial stream, one of these streams that flow over the top of the uh, glacier. And she brought it back to the lab, filtered it, inspected it carefully under the microscope and turned up no detectable microplastics. So sounds like a pretty good first clean bill of health. Um, but again, this is just a single sample. We can't say for sure, but and uh, follow up work would be great if we can get back there. <clears throat> then over in Suicide Basin, a uh, former UAS student, Jamie Pierce, went up there, who works for the USGS now, went up there with Professor Aaron Hood to, uh, to survey the basin for the Glacial Lake Outburst blood Flood study. And they filled up four stainless steel water bottles for me too and, to, and, and brought it back to the lab. And so I filtered it there, looked at it closely under the microscope. Here's a picture of one of the little square grids on the on the filter under the scope. And again, no microplastics. So yay, but it's uh, 2020. So that's it for the good news. And now we move into sites where we did find detections. All right, also on the glacier, this time glacier sediment. Uh, two students worked on that, Jacob Eberhardt and Joe Greeno. So they were inspired by a paper published about microplastics on the Italian Alps. This was a paper that that made the news there because they it was the first time uh, microplastics were documented on glaciers and it was in glacial sediment. So they wanted to look at differences between uh, places on the Mendenhall where a lot of tourists go versus where they didn't to see if people were shedding microplastics from all their fancy outdoor gear. And Jacob actually expanded this into a larger project through an independent uh, research, uh, direct research project funded by uh, BLAST. And he looked, he compared the Mendenhall to Herbert. So they went out to the Mendenhall and they trekked out there pretty far out from the edge here and they scooped up sediment. Um, yeah, this was like in November. I don't, I, it was bad. They were very brave. <laughs> it was pretty nasty out, but they went on their adventure. They got their sediment. They um, 
went back to the lab and did the various extractions that are needed where you put salt water in there and you try to float the plastics and you filter it and look at it again through the microscope. And they, um, the results of their work showed that there was, they did find microplastics in about half the samples. And so the average concentration was about 21 MP, meaning microplastic particles per, uh, per kilogram of sediment. And again, this is probably likely an underestimate because the techniques we're using here are pretty uh, rough. It's just like using the microscope. We don't have any fancy detectors and really high powered scopes. So we're probably missing a lot of the nanoplastics and we're missing the clear and white plastics and also sifting through sediments on a filter in a, um, through the microscope, my, my, uh, microscope misses a lot as well. But when they compared their concentration to that study in the Alps, they found that Mendenhall sediment had about a quarter of the amount found in those uh, in that Italian Alpine glacier with 74 kilograms per, I mean, particles per, set, uh, per kilo. They also found no spatial difference um, along the, in the Mendenhall and no, no difference between Mendenhall and Herbert, hinting to perhaps uniform atmospheric deposition. So that was uh, some work on the ice field. And then a couple more students went to Mendenhall Lake and Auk Lake and scooped up some water samples there, brought them back to the lab, filtered them, did the microscope in, um, inspections. And they found uh, quite a few microplastics per liter, definitely higher than what we were seeing in snow or uh, in a suicide basin. They were finding up to tw um, 27 microplastics per liter of water in these lakes. Um, I did a little follow up work with the student volunteer this summer finding uh, five, only five to six microplastics per liter. So again, this is based on limited samples. I don't know if there's seasonality to it or year to year variation, but that's something that I would really like to follow up on. And then as that was for lake water, and now we go to lake sediment for other students, Abby, Amy, Megan, and Muriel here, they took set sediment samples from Mendenhall Lake, just a few like four from Nugget, four from uh, West Glacier Trailhead, and six from Skater's Cabin. And they found fairly you know, consistent results, average of about you know, 25 to 43 microplastics per kilogram of sediment. Um, and just as a reminder, Jacob and Joe found about on average 21 up on the sitting on the glacier. And so these, these um, in terms of comparing it to other places in the world, again, these cross, uh, these comparisons with other studies are really tricky to do because there's a lot of different techniques people use. But from one study that I found using basically the same techniques, it was from a really busy urban lake in China. And this is two orders of magnitude lower than that. So compared to urban lakes in China, we're, we're still doing well. Okay, and then we did a, a bunch of people went out and did the work on microplastics in streams. In 2020, I went out with uh, my student volunteer, who's actually my high school daughter, but hey, she was in my COVID bubble. So I could take, I could drag her out with me when other students couldn't. So we went out to 17 different streams, sampled one to three times each, and we found microplastics in the water, you know, just filling up a water bottle, a, a glass or metal water bottle, filtering in the lab. There are microplastics in every liter of water on average about 3.7 microplastics per liter. So um, this, in terms of how this, uh, and I should say some, some samples we didn't detect it, at least with our small sample, you know, sample amounts. For example, the Herbert River had, had no microplastics, but then other streams that were kind of out the road and way out there did have some, it was, there was really no consistent spatial variation. <clears throat> and these values compare fairly well with a study done in some remote streams in Montana. Um, and they're definitely lower than a few European rivers and much lower than large rivers that flow through dense urban areas in various parts of the world. Um, they're about in line with values from say a remote Scottish lake. And I don't have time to show you all those studies, but we're kind of on the low end of what we see there, but, but not on the lowest. A bunch of students worked on stream sediments as well, 
Abby, Muriel, Joe, and Nolan. And for this, the difference with collecting stream sediment, actually just like lake and glacier sediment, is there's an added step. Instead of just filtering it, you have to um, add, because plastic's a lightweight material, you add salt water to the, to the sediment to, and it's really salty water to try to float the light plastic. But there's all these complications to it because the salt itself turns out has microplastics. This picture here shows the microscopic view, the microscope view of salt that I bought at the supermarket. And this is not a new discovery. People know this who study microplastics, but because salt mostly comes from the ocean and the ocean has microplastics, these little blue and turquoise specks here, there are microplastics in the salt. So we had to purify the salt and filter that and blah, blah. And then also it gets uh, tricky to sort through, as I said, these views of the um, of the sediment on a, on a filter. But anyway, so several different studies, Joe and Nolan compared Montana Creek, which is, you know, pr pretty clean to Jordan Creek in the valley, which is flows right through housing developments. My student, Abby Nathlich, who got an INBRI grant and went to a conference and presented her results. She did a bunch of sediment work throughout the Mendenhall Valley and from the lake the river and then compared it to Jordan Creek. And my student Muriel, she also did a directed research project and she compared uh, randomly selected urban and remote streams and beaches. Um, and finally, the summer collected uh, sediment from nine additional streams. And putting all this together, that's a lot of work there that I am just summarizing here out of the 63 total stream bed sediment samples on 11 different streams. We found microplastic fibers in 83% of the samples and fragments. So we divide them into fibers and fragments. Fibers are like, you know, like little, little, uh, well, they look like fibers, <laughs> little threads, as opposed to fragments, which look more like, you know, just a, a, a shape, just a sort of clumps of it in about a quarter of the samples. Um, the average was about 17 fibers and four fragments per kilogram of sediment. And and there was no significant difference between remote and urban streams, again, suggesting atmospheric deposition is important. There were a few small local site-specific observations. Uh, for example, Jordan Creek, the, the, the section that flows right through the development in the valley, um, had, had far more fragments. Cowie Creek, out the road, the sample is right downstream of the road crossing, and we found little fragments of tires and um, Skater's Cabin, which receives quite a bit of recreational use, also had some, some plastic fragments. And interestingly, this is one place that I wanna go back to is right below the sewage treatment plant on the Mendenhall River, we found these tangled mats of clear fibers, which as best we could tell were plastic, but I wanna go back and look at that again, but they were um, incredibly dense in that area. All right, and, um, Beaches, we went to the beaches too. Uh, the beach, beaches listed here on the right in orange. And uh, Abby, uh, Nathledge, Muriel, Amy, Amy Jensen and Megan Ellis collected these samples. And we found, um, oh, and, and this summer I collected some water, just walking out um, off the beach and filling up a water bottle. We found only um, one sample that was clearly above detection limit beyond and above the sort of background lab contamination. And so what we found was about five, uh, just in that one sample, about five microplastics per liter and comparing it to a global study, this was this really cool citizen science study um, where they, uh, people from all over the world who were on boats around the world uh, were, were collecting samples and sending it to this one lab. And you can see the scale of variation zero, one to five, all the way up to 250 microplastics per liter of marine water sample. And so the green and dark blue, that's what we found, um, you know, where we are here. Interestingly, in this study, they, they, they found greater sections like near these um, uh, garbage patches and in the Arctic actually higher than most other places. Anyway, for intertidal sediment, so beach sediment, uh, my students found uh, microplastics in 70%, 7% of the samples with an average of 29 microplastics per kilogram. And so 
putting this all together and in comparing it, there was a study done by the National Park Service and we actually, this is their, their methods are the ones that we followed exactly. So I think we can compare exactly to them. These are abbreviations for national parks that border the ocean and the um, number of microplastics per kilogram of uh, sand. And so the red ones are Alaskan parks, Great Lakes, Northeast and so forth. And so when we zoom in on the Alaskan parks, here I just inserted our Juno levels. So, um, you know, not the lowest, but fair, but among the lowest uh, values. And um, also pooling the other sediments that I mentioned, beaches, uh, well, beaches are 29, lakes, streams, and glaciers. We're all, you know, everything is kind of centered around this part of the bar graph. So yes, there's plastic there almost everywhere, but it's still fairly low. <clears throat> Finally, microplastics in the rain. This was probably the most surprising result that we found. Three students, Celia, Tonya, and Cami, went out last fall for their class project and put out rain collectors in six different parts of Juneau and collected rainwater for, for two weeks in a, just through like a stainless steel funnel into a glass jar, brought it back to the lab, filtered it, looked at it under the scope, and sure enough, they found quite a few fibers. And you can see some blue fibers here. And um, this is uh, most people's favorite color is blue. I did some research on that and <laughs> the fibers that they could find were half of them were blue. But uh, more uh, notable than that is the fact that on average, based on their, you know, their, their rain collecting, their rain collectors and the num and number of days that they had them out, every day, every square meter received 122 plastic particles here in Juneau. And most of those were fibers, a few fragments. So that I thought was a um, pretty uh, astounding number. And so I went and looked at the literature to see if that is unusual. And, um, oh wait, hold on. I think uh, something, I was gonna show you this here. So I went back in summer 2020 um, with the help of my field assistant daughter again. And we collected more rain. We put out rain collectors at four sites around town. You can see them here. This is out at DuPont. There's uh, the stainless steel funnel just passively collecting the rain into a glass jar. We don't want to use any plastic in our collections. Brought it back to the lab, filtered it, look at it under the scope. This is you know about a 30 time magnification. You can see that blue fiber there. And so so what those results show is that the, on average of all the rain samples from our four sites is roughly 80 fibers per square meter per day. And um, again, favorite color, everyone's favorite color is blue. Apparently these are the colors of the fibers that we found in the rain samples. And you know, seeing something like pink or red really helps. You can see that that stands out really well seeing clear or green is, is a lot tougher to figure out if it's plastic. We had various methods to, to test whether it was plastic or not, which I, I won't go into right now. But so comparison with other plastic rain studies, okay, there aren't that many, but there's a few in the Pyrenees Mountains in Southern France, 365 microplastics per square meter per day. In Paris, a big city, 163. And then in a uh, big city in China, 228. So what we were finding um, was uh, at about the students finding 122, me finding 81. That's on the lower end of that, not too far off. And then just this summer, a, a paper came out in Science uh, where uh, plastic rain in protected areas of the United States, so all over these national parks, parks and other protected lands in the US, there are these atmospheric uh, deposition collectors and they um, started uh, counting up the plastics that were falling there. And there they found here in the red circle, an average of 132 plastics per square meter per day. So that almost matches exactly what we found here in Juneau saying that the amount that we're getting from, you know, uh, long range transport in the world is arriving in Juneau at about the same level that these, uh, that um, 
uh, the, this, these wildlands or protected areas in the Western US are also getting. <clears throat> they also found a dominance of fibers over particles in that study. All right, so putting it all together, well, what we found is that microplastics are present almost everywhere we looked. On glacier sediment, in the lakes, lake water, lake sediment, in streams, beaches, and rain. Although not all those sites within each of those groups had detections. And to note that our methods have significant limitations into how much we detect. So I, I think it's fair to say that what we found was kind of a minimum. Um, we also, though, didn't detect any microplastics in one set of the ice field snow samples on that stream on the Mendenhall and Suicide Basin water. A few streams didn't have any and several samples of coastal marine water didn't have it. So although again, this is based on fairly small sample sizes and we cannot detect those nanoplastics and probably we're missing a lot of the white and clear fibers. Some studies have shown that just doing this kind of microscope level detection misses over 90% of the plastics present. <clears throat> Most of the microplastic abundances um, based on our, you know, our best uh, evaluations were on the low to medium end of published studies in the Pacific Northwest and Rocky Mountain region and elsewhere. So that's, you know, at least we're better off. And our data strongly suggest uh, that atmospheric deposition is the major way that these plastics are arriving here. So kind of in closing, almost, almost in closing, um, when this iconic Earthrise image was taken from the Apollo 8, it underscored how small and alone our planet is. This photo was taken in 1968 when the annual production of plastic was only 27 million tons a year compared to the 360 million tons, so 13 fold increase since this time. And so um, just like we learn from the rapid spread of the coronavirus to global climate change, it's um, actually a really small world that we live on. And what happens on one part of the world influences another part. And finally, to say, you know, we got to throw in something positive here, solutions. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do to change the trajectory of the kind of pollution on the planet, kind of stepping out of Juno now into the big scale. You know, the most important thing is to reduce plastic use, improve waste management, promote cleanup efforts, and also increase public awareness, repurpose existing plastic, find biodegradable substitutes, promote innovative solutions to enhance existing, oh, sorry, to degrade existing plastics, and of course, to enhance scientific research. Uh, a few of the photos I just uh, picked here, these are, this, uh, there's so much more than this, but these are these cool little seaweed pouches that they were giving out at the London Marathon last year. So they could just put these little energy drinks in them and then it's made out of seaweed and it just decomposes. Or there's of course a bamboo cutlery and bamboo is a much more um, sustainable material than plastic. Um, natural fibers replacing so many of the synthetic fibers that we use all the polyester and everything with, with natural fibers and also just producing less fibers in, in the first place. This is a photo of um, this uh, replacing styrofoam with a compostable mushroom-based packaging where they take like the hulls of oat and the castaway parts of agricultural products and they seed them with mushrooms and they grow this cool uh, um, soft packaging material. And probably a lot of you have heard of the Ocean Cleanup Project that's going out into the Pacific and it started its first harvest of, of uh, plastic in the ocean and it's, it's trying to sweep it up and it also has this interceptor in rivers. There's a lot of neat stuff happening to try to address this problem. It seems like the public is pretty interested and I have hope that we can uh, start steering this ship in a different direction with more um, awareness and then this piece of understanding the science and the scale of the impact is a key part of that. So finally, I just want to thank all my students. I could not have done any of this work without their help. 
and um, also collaborators on various parts of the project that people who fetched me samples and then also my funders. I got a University of Alaska Faculty Initiative Fund that funded me and one of my students, um, a BLAST fund uh, grant for Jacob and an IDEA uh, grant for Abby Nathlich. All right, and with that, I'd like to leave the remaining time for questions. And let me switch to the screen here. All right, so thanks. And I don't know how we, we can do questions with, um, um, oh, here we go. Kenny's organizing this. I'm just seeing chat for the first time. Jim's got a question for you. Okay. Oh, have you tested Juno's drinking water or from a private tap? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, yes, and I, it seems to be fine. Water that's coming out of the groundwater seems to be pretty well filtered. So uh, if it's stream water, like I did sample Salmon Creek, for example, and we found some microplastics in that, but the drinking water, and so ironically, so in the lab when we were doing this work, I was trying to get the deionized water to, I thought that would be just better water to use for when we were making our salt solutions and stuff. But then we found all these microplastics in that because in our building, they collect the water on the roof and then they deionize. Anyway, that was no good. But if it's most of our drinking water that's coming, that's being pulled out of wells and put in pipes, the little bit that I tested should be fine, but I haven't done a, um, a comprehensive look at that. I will say though that it's probably better. And in fact, most of the world's population that's drinking, that's um, having a lot of microplastic ingestion is coming from bottled water. The bottled water itself breaks down. Uh, people who drink bottled water ingest like three or four times more microplastics over the course of a year than people who drink tap water. Jeff Loftus has a question about CBJ's current efforts to repurpose plastic, other items such as glass. Um, I, okay, so once we get into policy like this, um, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not aware, doesn't mean that it's not happening. I'm not aware of any CBJ efforts to repurpose plastic um, as far as in terms of glass. I mean, someone correct me if you know the answer to that. I believe that they separate, you know, when you can bring glass to the recycling they, uh, they still put that in the landfill, but they crush it and use it as liner in the land. They have a specific purpose for it rather than using some other kind of aggregate material. So it's, it's reused, but it's definitely not recycled glass. Um, I don't know about CBJ doing anything to repurpose plastic. I don't see any more questions in the chat, but perhaps um, if, if anybody wants to unmute their mic, oh, Andy has a question. <laughs> Representative Story, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, oh, I mean, I can read it out loud. Or Andy, go ahead, please. You're on mute though. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, you qualified a lot of your findings with saying that these are very small sample sizes, one sample size. Um, or more, are you going to, what are your plans to um, substantiate this more uh, research plans or what do you think uh, needs to happen to um, solidify your findings more? Yeah, I mean, more samples, that'd be, that'd be better, right? So I'm, uh, any students tuning in, if you wanna do an independent research project, we can uh, probably find some grant funding to support you. So. You know, it's just, uh, unless there's other people working on this and I'm not aware, you know, it's just me and I've got, you know, a million other things going on too. So I would like to keep working on it. It would be nice to um, to keep getting student interest. It's, it seems like at least just doing this basic microscope, mm -hmm. mi microscopic based method, it's, it's a pretty um, a cheap type of uh, science that can be done. So uh, I, um, I would like to continue it next summer. I am looking into some grants to do some more work on this topic next summer. And yes, even though it's just a few samples, 
I, I mean, some, so, some of our aspects were pretty big, like the stream bed sediment. We had, we had a lot of effort on that and I've got a lot of rainwater samples. So it would be um, worthwhile to probably pull this together into a, um, in, into a report that could be published for reference as things change in the future. Um, as for edu educating the public, well, this is my first attempt at it, you know, and I think it's um, all this hard work by my students put together that's actually uh, amassed into a pretty uh, big project to get this sort of first view. It's, um, it's kind of exciting to look at new, a new type of scientific problem and to even see what's out there. Like, I didn't even know if we would find anything. I didn't think we'd find anything in the rain. I thought we would find everything in the stream bed sediments, but really the stream bed sediments didn't have that much compared to uh, some of the atmospheric deposition. So there's just a lot of discovery. And as I said, the science is really not even settled on how best to sample. And how do you count these things? Like if you have a fiber that's as long as your filter, that gets counted as one. Or if you have like a teeny tiny little speck, that's also mm -hmm. counted as one. And you can't wait. There's all these questions about how do we quantify this material? How do we characterize it? Does it even matter? There's so much that's happening with it, but I just wanted to uh, first go out and see what we could even find. So it's kind of this first uh, initial scale survey of what's even here. And it's hard from, uh, you know, as a scientist, it's hard to make any grand conclusions from this because there are limitations, but um, I, yeah, I would like to keep working on it for sure. So Sonia? Yes. Do you happen to know Julie Masura down here at uh, Washington University of Washington Tacoma, who has done some work on microplastics? No. I'm not sure if she's still doing it, but I know she was. Okay. Kelsey has a question. Okay, Are there citizen science know. options for Juno residents? Yeah, that would be really neat. I think um, it's just needing to organize that. But yeah, there's been some really cool. So if those of you who aren't familiar, citizen science is where there's some kind of problem. And instead of one scientist or a small group of them trying to run around everywhere, trying to collect samples, it's like if we can, if it's in something fairly straightforward, if we could give it to people for them to collect the samples and bring it to us, like that, that study I showed you briefly of uh, grab samples from oceans all over the world, then uh, you can, you know, multiply your amount of samples, you know, at, by, by tremendous numbers, and you can also at the same time educate the public. So there's a lot of benefit to citizen science and organizing something like that, I think would be um, that, that I've thought about that. And I think it'd be really neat to do that all over Southeast. So, you know, just to go all throughout the archipelago and see what's out there. Sonia, did you just want to read the questions from out of the okay. chat? It sounds like you're you're on top of it. <laughs> okay. Um, do you know if other countries or U.S. states or communities that have restrictions for using plastics? Um, yeah, I'm like in um, California. There's the plastic bag ban, and then there's always. They're like, well, but paper bags are harder on the environment than plastic bags. There's always those debates, right? And then with COVID, everything is, the clock is turned back in the sense that all these single use plastics are, are accelerating this year with all the needs to, you know, need to be um, uh, disposable and clean and all that. So um there are definitely, it's a state that from the federal level, we're not getting anything, I don't think, uh, for that, but some states are, and local communities are, are banning um, single use, I think California is at the forefront of those kinds of changes. And if anyone else here knows more, like if you're from other places and you know about what's happening, I think it's locally driven and Europe of course is doing great with it too. They're, they, they have pretty extensive bans and uh, pretty lofty ambitious goals for phasing out use of plastic in a lot of material. In Seattle, where I am, we had mm -hmm. a ban on plastic bags. You couldn't get one in the grocery store and many, many people bringing their own canvas bags. But since the COVID thing, they won't let us bring our canvas bags in the store anymore. 
So there's a lot more plastic going out. I know. Yeah, and then I think it depends on the store. Some of them will let you bring it, but you can't set it down. And so you can, or other places, they won't let you bring it. I know. A uh, question here, how did you determine the fibers from the rain were plastic? Okay, so one of the techniques we use under the, when we're looking at a fiber under the microscope, like is that, is that plastic or not? Well, if we're not, it, there's a few different ways to identify it. One is that like, there are uniform thickness, they don't branch, they, um, sometimes the color gives it away and then you can look at really closely high magnification and look for any cellular structure. If there's no cellular, cellular structure, that's a clue. And then if it's still unclear, we can do what's called the hot needle test. So you heat up a needle in a flame and then you touch the fiber on, um, on your Petri dish that you're looking at under the microscope. And if it curls, then it's plastic. If it doesn't curl, it's uh, organic material. So using, uh, and, and then we have these, you know, these guides and we try, we do our best uh, determination if it's plastic, but that, uh, that heat test is a good one. Um, is anyone recycling plastic into building materials? Uh, yes, I, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think, in, not that I know of in Juneau, but I've heard of that happening. There is a company in New Zealand that is, that I've heard of, it might, it's probably, maybe it's not the only one, but I was looking at that. Um, but the, yeah, they were taking plastic waste and refabbing it into like building blocks, like brick-like blocks and using that to um, use as really long lasting building material. And that's also nice because it, it you know, prevents it from flowing to the ocean and from breaking down into small pieces at least anytime soon. All right, I see some volunteers for a citizen science project. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, uh, let's see. JP Cholamal at Mount Edgecombe High School in Sitka has been doing similar research with the Sitka tribes lab on a smaller scale around Sitka. They have focused on the amount of microplastics and clams, mussels, and other shellfish. I did hear something on KTO about that a year or two ago, and I wonder if that's the same one. Um, thanks for the name. I would, it would be great to link up with them. All right, Anchorage has a plastic bag ban as of 2019. Didn't even Wasilla have one? It's like, and Juno can't do it. <laughs> I don't know why. Why doesn't Juno have a plastic bag ban? ban? I don't know. Maybe someone can answer that. Jim, do you know? Well, uh, this may be political, but with the new assembly, there's hope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Personal freedoms. It's actually a hard thing because a business yeah. have to make uh, transitions and that's difficult on um, businesses and but I think it can be done and we just have to, we just have to bite the bullet and do it. And especially with this, I think this, this whole thing with the information you just gave, my God, that's the first step is getting the science out and the information. Are there other questions? Let's see. Oh, what are the, oh, we got some from uh, Tom Zainsworth. Uh, what are the most serious types of plastics should I avoid as a consumer? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so pl plastic recycling is really kind of a nightmare. It doesn't really get recycled. I mean, plastics one and two, you feel good about putting that in the recycling, but it's kind of a mystery if that really gets recycled. It's very difficult technically to recycle it. It's not really worth it economically because oil is so cheap that the plastic's made from. It's often cheaper to just make new plastic. Um, but the other plastics like three, four, five, so the styrofoam cannot be recycled basically. Any of those, th those little uh, numbers with the chasing arrows that you see on the labels, the, it has to do with the, the chemical, that, the chemical composition of that plastic. And some of it is more or less, uh, and really one and two, as I'm saying, are barely recyclable. Oh, Laura Vess is saying number three is the worst one. Okay, yeah. 
um, pretty much anything at it, uh, anything three and up is never is not going to be recycled and putting in the recycling bin is probably worse than throwing it out because if we throw it out here, it'll be buried in the landfill and maybe decompose by the time the landfill erodes back into the ocean. But a lot of the recycling that is sorted in these giant recycling centers down south, those things just get sold to um, fairly impoverished countries that uh, then have pretty bad uh, waste management practices. And then a lot of what we think is getting recycled gets uh, dumped back into the ocean there from what, but it's, it's uh, not, you know, that's, it's a complex issue. It's not like that everywhere, but um, the best thing to do is to really reduce how much you bring home in the first place. Cause pretty much all the plastic you've ever used in your life, almost all of it, probably 90 plus percent of it is still around in the world. And so if we can just try to curb how much we use and try to use reusable containers and buy things in bulk and that kind of thing, it will add up if everyone does that, it makes a difference. And to not buy stuff you don't need. Looks like you got a question there, Buffy Holderin, Holdener. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, this is Buffy Holdener. And uh, I'm just curious about uh, your, what I understood you talking specifically about was uh, the microplastics and they were fibers. And what I was understanding is that that was fibers that was from uh, the plastic type of materials or clothing that we use, like the fleece and that kind of thing. You said that it's a lot airborne, but what we've just been talking about is the plastics that uh, are more uh, prevalent in the physical form of a uh, plastic bottle or a plastic bag, et cetera. And so I'm just kind of curious because you did say that there were some chunks in those samples that would I would think would come from something more physical like a plastic bottle. But uh, it seemed to me that most of your study was mostly finding the microfibers on that come from like fleece, et cetera. Am I, mm -hmm. what, did I misunderstand that? No, that's right. Most of the fi most of the material we found were fibers, and it could be that the particles, more of the fragments. Uh, sink and they don't transport as well. Um, like little aerodynamic studies show that the fibers are more uh, likely to be picked up by the wind and transported over far distances. They're really low density, they're lightweight, and their, um, their um, geometry is such that they can be picked up in air currents and move around the world really easily. And they can also plastic that's fragmented on the ocean and that's floating like that can be uh, picked up and like the, the drag forces are really low on those kind of fibers. So uh, yeah, where it's coming from, a lot of it, it does come from shedding of these fibers during um, laundering and just other, uh, and you can also get, it's not just clothing, but, you know, interior, uh, like carpeting, that's all made with plastic fibers. That stuff gets shed and probably released into the air when you walk on it. And, um, and again, the, the science isn't like, maybe, maybe none of that matters. Maybe breathing in these plastic fibers, maybe they don't lodge in your, we don't really know what happens. It's, it's all so new. I don't also want to be an alarmist and say, oh, this stuff is in the rain and in the air and we need to panic. Like, I, I'm just saying it's there and we don't know. I don't really know what the impacts are. There's some indication that, you know, in these controlled lab studies, it can impact microbial activity. And um, we know that some of the chemicals attached to plastic can be toxic at certain levels, but it's really an emerging science. So I also... I want to actually really stress that I don't want to you to I don't want to come away with like yet another thing to be worried about, especially this year. <laughs> well, I, I didn't think yeah, that, plenty. Uh, you were really being that much of an alarmist about it. I think it was just very informational. And thank you again for the topic. But I my can my uh, interest in that mostly is that as an avid hiker, obviously, uh, especially as a long distance hiker, the uh, synthetics and the fleece, et cetera, become uh, very desirable because of the lightweightness of it, you know, that it's lighter weight and so it's easier to pack and it's easier to do whatever. And so, you know, I think about, okay, how can I 
change my habits to uh, address that situation as another previous person commented about, you know, what can we do to help? And, uh, you know, it's very interesting because when I think about the organic options of uh, materials to, to have or wear, you know, and uh, obviously wool is one of them, but, uh, you know, if you're going to go on a long distance hiking trip, I'm definitely not going to put my wool shirt <laughs> into my pack. So I was just curious from yeah. your perspective, because I certainly have a lot of synthetic clothing in my closet. Yeah, I think we all do, especially living in Juneau. I mean, it's unsafe to go out in cotton in the rain, right? I mean, we just, it's, I think it's, I think it's kind of a matter of opinion, but I mean, I think since I've become aware of this issue, I've tried to maybe like buying fewer, but better quality products. Um, even studies have shown that like the cheap fleece releases more in the laundry than, than really high quality um, uh, material. And so Anyway, I think it's also just a question of, uh, of volume. There's There's been such a huge increase in the amount of clothes that we, we produce and buy. Clothing is really cheap now. It's only gotten cheaper with synthetics being woven in with cotton. Like you can bar barely find a cotton t-shirt these days because cotton's more expensive than a poly, you know, poly cotton blend shirt. And yeah, so there's, um, you know, it's just a matter of scale too. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. It looks like we're winding down a bit. I see the some people are taking off. If there aren't any other questions, maybe a last uh, call for questions. I would just like to say hello to a grizzly from a bobcat. Yeah. <laughs> so I said a geology at MSU. Oh, you did. Okay. All right. Great. So, uh, Dr. Nagorski, thank you so much. I think that you're. Uh, you know, this, these are the ground steps to start with, knowledge and, and awareness and moving towards it. What's really neat is we have local people going and doing this stuff and undergraduates doing research. It's so wonderful. And uh, so we're getting local knowledge that contributes to global knowledge, which is just wonderful. Fantastic presentation. Um, so if there isn't anything else, I think we'll close up. You're getting some thank yous now. And, and uh, We'll All right. Thanks everyone yeah. for being here. Really, um, really you. appreciate you coming to my talk. Thank you, Dr. And thank you, Jim. Thank you everyone. And Kenny for organizing. Yes, Kenny. Thanks so <laughs> much. Thank you and, guys uh, both for being speakers this, this season. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye.